Thank you everyone for joining us today for this exciting webinar. You know, as we know, implant supported prosthetics are growing in market share. But what are the solutions that we're providing to our, our dentists and ultimately their patients? We want to always at the very forefront is the ability of providing them with the best biomechanic proper uh, solutions. And I'm excited to share with you a solution for implant supported restoration as a bar with Trilor. Uh, Trilor is a technopolymer that is consisting of 75% uh, glass fibers uh, with 25% in a composite matrix. And that gives a lot of opportunity and ability uh, to really thrive with the material. Let me just... So Trilor is manufactured in Milan, Italy by BioLoren and Harvest Dental Product is the exclusive distributor in, in North America as well as you can purchase it from Zahn. It is, as I said, a high, a high performance technopolymer matrix with a multi-directional glass fibers. The, the glass fibers is actually what gives it the incredible strength, right? So it's different, it's not, it's, it's in the high performance technopolymers, but it's, it's head and shoulders above some of the competitors because of those glass fiber reinforcements. So what it does is being that they're multi-directional, which means in the X, Y, and Z axis, you get a significantly stronger strength and it is a polymer, so it is a uh, metal-free restoration. However, it, that exact polymer or that glass matrix in a composite provides benefits beyond what the actual structure of it, and I'll discuss that in more detail. So certainly 75% of the material is created out of glass, um, the glass fibers, and it's reinforced in 25% composite. So the composite lends itself to bondability. It lends itself to incredible lightweight as compared to a zirconia or even a titanium restoration. And the composite with the, the denture, which I'll share with you, actual cases and workflows that were um, shown through that provide a seamless link between the overdenture and the bar. It also provides some incredible benefits with the ability of absorbing any of the mastication forces. So again, we'll get into a little bit more in, in a few seconds, but just to give you an idea, both materials that I've just spoken about, whether it's zirconia or titanium, are incredibly rigid. And they're rigid for a purpose, for a reason, because you want them, especially on a, across a full arch, you, need, you want the rigidity. However, for the implant interface, the actual where the implant is within the bone, that can some that oftentimes can have dire consequences. So what does that mean? That means if it's zirconia or titanium and the patient has a paranormal function, the forces are distributed among the material and then down into the implants. The difference between Trilor and any of the other two that are the rigid ones, um, you know, the forces then Obviously, as we know, titanium does not give at all. So the only thing that gives is the bone. And if there are some paranormal functions and there's some opportunities for forces to be distributed down into the bone, oftentimes, if it's not calibrated properly, equilibrated properly, uh, and the bite is has paranormal functions, it could have dire consequences to the point that the implant fixture or the implant placement may fail. Trilor provides a little bit of that cushioning, uh, whereby it's different than titanium because it has that, flex, that slight cushioning that the absorption actually is taken or, or absorbed by the Trilor material rather than the, the implant fixtures. So it's very important, and that's what really makes the, the, um, the material unique. It has tensile strength of 380 megapascals, as well as the flexural strength of 540. Now, those two numbers are very important because the flexural strength and the tensile strength are two different things. Obviously, the flexural strength is the ability where to bend prior to it breaking, and the tensile strength is the actual application of load onto the material. And I'll show you in a little bit a comparison chart of some of the, the other materials in the market, including bone, including natural tooth. And you can see for yourself also how those parameters or those uh, strengths really behave. It's important to realize that our restorations are going into people's mouths and the biomechanism or the biomechanical properties 
really affect the success or the lack of of the implant fixtures and the implant restoration. So as you see here, the Trilor does have a uh, certification both in Europe with the CE as well as the FDA here in the US and Brazil. But what's important to note here is that it is a permanent prosthetic material. So it's not a temporary, it's not something that's going to need to be replaced. It is validated and standardized and, cer and certified as a, a permanent prosthetic material. So that gives you a, a sense of, you know, um, you can rest assured with great confidence to share with your dentist clients that this has been approved and has been certified by the FDA here in the U.S., to accomplish a permanent prosthetic restoration. It's a very lightweight, biocompatible, permanent anesthetic restoration, and I'll get into that in, in a little bit. So the it's, it's something to note, and oftentimes when you speak to, to dentists, it's, it, that's what they want to understand, because you know they hear sometimes polymer, they, they're thinking of acrylics, they're thinking of PMMAs, and that's furthest from the truth. This material is really on a class of its own because of the glass fibers. It really provides a great cushioning while maintaining the significant strength. So this is a chart that Har Harvest has put together that really displays and, and, and truly across every, all the gamut. So here you have on the, on the very left, you have the, the trilor material. And as I shared with you, it has 380 megapascal as well as flexural strength of 540. So you can see it, there's a significant increase into how much it will absorb the forces or bend without it affecting dimensionally the material. So looking at some, you know, the, the major competitors to, to this market, uh, you have the Javora Peak and you have the Pecton as well as the Trinia. And when you look at the tensile strength, you can see that the Trilor is, again, more than double of Peak. Um, certainly more than double and close and double of trinia. Then when you look at the flexural strength, it too is four times more so than than peak, um, two hundred times more than than pecton, and as well as it's it's two hundred points higher than MPA. So those are the two things that really really stand out. And it, when I explain the biomechanics and the ramification of it, it really truly makes a an incredible successful re implant supported restorations. So, and again, I'm you know when looking at titanium, looking at zirconia, obviously those it goes in, in a different direction. So let's take a look at those again. A tensile strength, 380. Certainly, it's way above any of the others. And this is the hardness. You can see where we get into zirconia as well as the titanium rather. Uh, 1400 megapascals. That's a tremendous amount of of strength and rigidity. And again, it's it you know oftentimes we keep hearing MPAs and and especially with zirconia and zirconia too. There's nothing wrong with zirconia, but not every case is suited for zirconia. There are some patients that are bruxous. There are some patients that have a paranormal function that are actually destructive to their teeth. You know, oftentimes they get to a situation that they're in where the, we have to do a complete arch rehabilitation for multiple reasons, whether it be hygiene, whether it be paranormal functions and so many other things that knowing and understanding the material science behind what it is that we're restoring is important. You know, so understanding that a rigid material like titanium provides a, you know, it's a great source and it's been the golden standard for a, a very long time. However, what we've seen over years is studies with paranormal functions with bruxers and so on that they actually, those, those forces travel down into the implant fixtures and over time move it every so slightly with every function. You can imagine how often you use your, your mouth and your teeth that it just dislodges the implant or wiggles the, the implant out and then ultimately it becomes a, a case that fails. Um, so it's something to take note of. And again, it's a conversation to be had with your dentist clients. There is a solution, which is what I'm excited about with this. And this specific webinar speaks directly to the bar and the implant, uh, rather in the denture type of uh, solution. Uh, there's other ways of using Trilor uh, but this one is specifically about the implant, the denture, uh, implant over denture kind of case. So there, where there needs to be a bar, but for support, for strength, for cross arch stabilization, 
with having an aesthetic uh, denture over it. Uh, titanium is a, a very, it's a biocompatible, but you can see that the strength is incredibly too strong, too much, uh, and therefore it lends itself to the rigidity. So when anything is to give, you want to look at, you know, what is, so the human bone, for example, is at 205 megapascals. So when you have something as high as the 1100 megapascals, and now you're, ha you're having pounding forces on the on the on the bar, it doesn't it, it doesn't bend. It doesn't absorb any of those forces. So what does the next the next interface, which happens to be the bone, which happens to be the implant? So this will not only provide for a lightweight biocompatible where the, the patient would absolutely love it, but it also provides for a better solution for the patient, a, a more viable solution that will absolutely um, you know remain for a, as a permanent restoration. So what are some of the drivers and why are we doing what we're doing? So implant market has been growing in leaps and bounds. Certainly digital has been as well, but the implant market is something to take note of. Now it's, it's the, one of the fastest growing businesses in the dental industry. And that's because there's a higher percent of general practitioners that are placing implants. And especially with, you know, with COVID, it's become even more of an aggressive pull towards general practitioners. Now I look at that as an opportunity for dental laboratories in a big way. Because dental laboratories, who do we serve most? We serve most general practitioners. And if we become that consultative approach, kind of in the team approach, dental team approach, they rely on the dental laboratory to provide them with the best solutions. And that's where with this webinar, my focus is to arm you as a dental laboratory with the knowledge and understanding of the material and the solution, the implant supported solution, so that you can then go ahead and, and perform that consultative approach with your with your clients. Um, there are more and more a higher percentage of general practitioners. There's more predictable surgical and restorative results. These are all things that will make thing that will make this um, implant market grow greater than ever. Now I don't have statistics for 2019 and 2020 and again we know that that's because of COVID. Uh, that just kind of pulled back, but I'm expecting it to shrink a little bit, but nonetheless, the demand is there. Uh, patients are more aware than they've ever been before as to what their restorative solutions and what kind of implant. You know, it's, it's funny, you, you speak to some dentists and, you know, the paradigm shift has been incredible over the last I want to say 10, 10 to eight years. And where it used to be when I was speaking with my, you know, dentist clients, it would be where, you know, the dental laboratory and, and oftentimes the clinician and all the time, the clinician is the one that proposes a solution and the patient says, well, you're the doctor and you know what's best. Um, this is the direction we're going to go. That has changed quite a bit. That has changed because now, patients actually where do they go first they don't ask their dentist they go to this thing i don't know if you've ever heard of it it's called google one of the first things that they do is they google and there's even facebook um pages designated for and created for patients for implants and they ask questions and dentists chime in but now oftentimes dent patients come into the dental office already knowing ahead of time they even come in asking by product or by type of solution uh, what is the best route for them? So the the ability of in, the having a predictable and surgical restorative results, they are well aware. You know, with implants, perhaps uh, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, the success rate was in the high 80s to low 90s, and sometimes even lower. Now with surgical guides and especially with digital technology, the success rate of implants, as long as the patient's health is appropriate. The success rate of implants are hovering at 97, 98 percent. Even I've seen some figures close to 99 percent. So that allows the confidence of the general practitioner to then engage more with implant-supported prosthetics. And who's best equipped to help them with that gaining that revenue stream than a dental laboratory? So we also see the enhanced in precision and fit, and that's a consistent and repeatable result from digital technology. So how do we harness that digital technology and how do we utilize this in exactly the conversation we're speaking of? Um, utilizing a product or a material like Trilor is really something that digital has brought about, about, 
pond. It's something that is unique and different than, than what was before. But the global dental implant market is expected to grow to a $7.4 million billion dollar business. That's a huge market, and that's a piece that I, I, I hope and wish for each and every one of you on this webinar to be able to attain, and we need to do that in order to create that uh, solution. Now, why is it I said earlier that the most important thing is the patient, and the patient first, and the biomechanics of it? Because at the end of the day, who needs the metal type of free restoration? Whether it's our mothers or fathers, our brothers or sisters, our uncles, our grandparents, whatever the case may be, they deserve the very best. And that's my philosophy has always been, what can we provide for our patient that is the very best for them? And at the end of the day, if they're not your mother or father, your brother or sister, your uncle, they're somebody's and they deserve exactly the same. So I, I, I have this slide only to really illustrate and the mindset of what 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 is the driving force of any kind of solution it's not necessarily a cost it's always about what is the best benefit for the patient and biomechanics is a huge part of what is best for the patient because we wanted to be able to sustain the masticatory forces and really thrive for a very very long time and as i said the fda has approved this as a um a, um, a permanent restoration. So now this is a, a short video that I'm going to share with you uh, regarding the weight of the material. So this is a video just demonstrating, and our friends at Alien Milling uh, have provided that video, which I thought was really cool, and I kind of asked them if I could use it as well. Um, it's something that really, I mean, if you notice it from the video the, with the scale, it is a third of the weight of titanium, and it is even a sixth of the weight of, um, you know, um, zirconia. So as far as biocompatibility and weight, I, I speak to, to patients after having these type of restorative cases, and they tend to say that they forget that they even have a, a restorative um, full arch. They, they, they feel like it's their own teeth because it behaves and is at lightweight and really truly behaves as their own teeth. So they tend to forget that they even have a prosthetic. So it replaces the unforgiving metal and zirconia framework, certainly as we spoke quite a bit. It is a metal-free and biocompatible solution. Um, it, the body doesn't have adverse reaction. And in fact, this exact material has been used for different type of bone and cartilage and, and uh, you know, things like hip replacement, knee replacement, and so on, because of its biocompatibility and, and ability. It's also incredibly affordable. So not only is it affordable in price for, you know, the, the puck that you can purchase from Zon Dental, um, but the ability of having multiple um, bars, you can fit, depending on how you nest and the size of it, but certainly three bars to up to sometimes even four, maybe even five bars, depending on its geometric dimension. Now, at that point, it becomes insignificant as to what the cost is. Certainly, if right now you are sending out or outsourcing your titanium bars, it will drastically reduce the, the costs of what you're spending on your titanium bars, which again, what does that mean for you? That means for you, profitability. There's also a time saving, whether you're outsourcing bars, um, typically the fastest you can possibly get it is within three days plus shipping sometimes five, sometimes even greater. You can now, with, with Trilor, you can mill it in-house, and it's been validated by several um, milling systems, as well as it's, it's included into the newest for, CAM softwares. So time is money, as we all know, and being able to save that time and have that time reclaimed allows you to process more cases and therefore generating more revenue and ultimately more profitability. It's a high strength, and now there is even pink. And pink is something that I'm very excited about. And I was, you know, I was a part of of getting that here into into the U.S. and and into the market. 
because oftentimes, and certainly as we're speaking today, when we're getting into overdenture type of bars, what do we have to do with titanium? We had to do one of, of two things. We had to opaque it and then sometimes even um, increase the amount of acrylic so that visually you can't see the titanium bar through it. By having the pink, and the same also you can purchase it in Trilor in bone color, but the pink really, really enhances that. You don't have to worry about how the pink will look underneath the denture. You don't have to compromise the thickness of it because the pink blends itself to the pink acrylic really, really nicely. So that means that you can even create a more robust bar, a higher strength bar, a bigger bar underneath it without being worried about the consequences of what that would look like aesthetically. I think that's a huge game changer when it comes to overdenture bars. Now, procedures in the dental laboratory. So there's a denture setup similar to what we've always done. Uh, you want to you want to capture the and the the centric occlusion, and then articulate it and then scan it. Once you've scanned it, you can then process it, and the patient is happy. And now you can start on on the hybrid. Now, one of the procedures at the dental laboratory, it's imperative to have a a implant master model with a removable one piece tissue. It's really important. And one thing that I absolutely suggest to never ever go beyond is without a verification jig, quite honestly, I don't progress with, with a case, any kind of implant supported case uh, that is more than two implant sites. So after fully osteointegrated, as you see here, um, I always create a verification jig. And what the verification jig, which is also called the Sheffield uh, test, is a, you wanna make sure that it's passive. Whether you're doing an all on X of any sort of implant supported solution, you need to make sure that it is passive because if it's not passive, again, the dire consequences are gonna come either to the prosthetic failure or the implant failure, which either one is a good option. So you can accomplish this either, as you see here on the left, with by milling out of PMMA or whatever have you a simple bar, uh, sending it back to, to the dentist. And whether it's a digital impression or an analog impression, I always verify any kind of implant supported cross arch. Because you wanna make sure, you know, you wanna spend, I mean, these are um, cents, pennies, compared to what it will cost if you actually fabricate the restoration and then it gets sent back because it doesn't have a passive fit. So the way to accomplish that in, on the left-hand side is through digital, on the right-hand side is through analog with Primatech, which is what I like to use. You wanna use a zero shrinkage or as close to a zero shrinkage type of material so that the dentist can verify it. The way the verification jig, you can have it either sectioned or together for the dentist to section it. That's a complete, you know, up to the dentist and up to the laboratory, but both processes work. Just if you do section it, make sure that the section is, or the sectioning is as thin as possible um, because oftentimes the dentist may use a, you know, acrylic or even um, um, Duralay which does have a greater shrinkage. So the greater the void or the greater the path where the separation is, the more shrinkage opportunity there is to do. Again, I use Primatech, which is a, a great material that has, it's light cured and it has a zero shrinkage that you can quickly and easily accomplish. But then you have to let the dentist know that it needs to be accomplished through a, um, a Sheffield test, which means that you start from the very uh, terminal side, you screw only down one, one, one implant and you view all the others to make sure none of, nothing lifts up or nothing. Yeah. And then once you accomplish that and nothing lifts up and they do it intraorally, you remove that one screw, you go to the other side, you do the same thing and you do that for every single implant fixture, one screw at a time, making sure that everything's passive and nothing moves in a way. Again, I don't recommend progressing forward with any kind of implant cross arch solution without having this uh, verification jig. So how do you create a work order? You can create a work order and, and in three shape is certainly a, a process that is very sim uh, simple. It's just like you would for designing a, um, a, a bar. Um, and in fact, if you, there is a DME for Trilor uh, through Harvest Dental, but they, you can design a bar with the right parameters, with the right material. 
but you want to create a regular um, a bar with Bummit. Now, even with the Trilor, you can utilize a attachments, and some people like to have it removable with the attachments, um, which is fine, but you need to tap into it. Sorry. You need to tap into the, the bar in, in, um, after it is milled. So establishing the order form is where you would um, first establish the actual implant uh, fixtures by having it as a, um, a custom abutment and then going into the areas or the teeth that you're extending the bar. Um, and then finally click on, on bridge and then the bar fixture. Now, the bar is important because you want to make sure that you have the proper uh, dimensions into the bar. And again, the design is no different than what we've typically done with, with titanium. But if you're utilizing pink trilor, again, you can increase or make it more robust and therefore benefit greater than what you've done before. Um, scanning the model in three shape it, depending on the type of system you use it, it becomes a and again this is already the validated or verified i should say um implant model so i only do this after verifying the the implant and making sure that with the sheffield test that it is or does have the the appropriate or the proper um passivity so this is a quick video of the designing of a bar and one thing that we still have to inf to contemplate and, and make sure of is the AP spread. So for some of you that may not know, AP spread is the anterior posterior spread, which is, you know, it's it's a fulcrum process where the distance from the most anterior to the posterior, you can only cantilever it by 50% of that. Um, and then what that does is if you infringe upon it, as the patient bites down on, on the posterior section or masticates normally, I mean, they don't select whether they're, pat they're biting down on the posterior or the anterior, but nonetheless, as they're biting down, if you infringe or are not in compliance of the AP spread, what it does is it creates a fulcrum where more, more towards distally, there's more pressure. And actually, I've seen cases where the anterior uh, implants actually fail or, or get dislodged or come out because the person did not um, accomplish the, the, a, the proper AP spread. So here you have me scanning the, the all on four type of cases you see here. Uh, we, I allocate the very last uh, space and identify and annotate exactly where my implant sites are. Now I do use the insertion direction and then it, it right away, it's a very quick and easy design. I always have the denture that I'm, I'm working under, uh, and it could also be a, a diagnostic or as well as a temporary. Um, we just want the rendering of wherever the biological space is, where the patient is comfortable so that they don't feel with their tongue or on the roof of their mouth that it's something that you know is foreign. So I always want to capture that information, and I tell my dentist to and either take an impression or scan it so that I can see exactly, because I want to make it as comfortable for the patient as possible. Now, it also allows me to load the best forces right underneath the denture. And where do you want it? Right under the lingual uh, sing cingulums or right under um, where the mastication is. So the forces will proceed to go down. Then you design a bar and, and the bar is a, um, you can use a dolder bar, which is what I use here. You can change the parameters. Now, one thing that I do with my designs, and you'll see, just because the cylinders are there in three shape, I like to make everything smooth. And I am not a fan of grinding, so certainly making things as smooth as possible with the cylinders, I, I in decrease it as possible because it is mill being milled out of the same material. So there's really no need to have multiple channels and then the bar and have that separation. Quite honestly, whenever you have that separation, it's it's a uh, interface where it may fail because you have that. So again, it, it all comes down to biomechanics and the forces and the forces will always travel down to the weakest link. So if you have that bifurcation or you have that space, and this is what I'm showing here with the AP spread, the three shape does a very nice job when you infringe upon it or push it beyond the AP, it becomes red and alerts you. Unfortunately, it still allows you to progress. So you do have to understand that it's something that you need to accomplish. Um, but make sure it does alert you with a red color uh, once you, you infringe beyond the AP spread. And now I'm designing 
putting it right into with the intention of how does the the occlusion or the functionality and the biomechanics of it work. I want it to be underneath the denture teeth where there's still enough acrylic to be able, but yet I want to support the denture in the best possible way. And how do we support the denture? In the way that it masticates. How does it, you know, we want to watch and see. Here I'm, I'm showing how you can also include a attachment um, that you can make this removable if that's what your dentist, um, you know, chooses. Now, quite candidly, most of the cases are just a wraparound denture that you process over the trilobe bar. However, I'm showing this just to be able to show that you can do the same thing if somebody wants to be able to detach it. But most cases, quite honestly, I'm doing now with um, with wraparound, so it becomes a, uh, a a fixed denture rather than a detachable, but the possibilities of doing a detachable is there. Then you want to cut into to see exactly where the implant um, or the attachments are. And you can see Three Shape Soaper does a very nice job with preparing the hole as to where the attachment would be. You will still have to then pilot it in and drive it in and create those, um, the screw holes, or the screw leads and um, be able to tap it rather is, the, is what I'm, I'm looking for. So you see now I'm smoothing everything over just to make sure that I'd rather spend another two minutes in design than have to then grind into it later on. I allow the mill to do all the work so that there's less and less work that is required of post-processing. To me, that's the smart way of utilizing digital. Uh, if you're utilizing digital in a way that you still have to do a lot of manual dexterity work afterwards, then perhaps you're not using it as, as efficiently as it could be. And, you know, that's a individual's philosophy or individual's mindset. I do prefer to utilize the software to as much as possible so that I don't have to accomplish any kind of post uh, finishing thereafter. And that's in essence your bar, and you can see that a titanium bar, you can do very much the same. A trilo bar, um, I was able to, with the denture teeth and the diagnostic, uh, whichever one, um, I'm able to then strategically place the bar, make it thicker wherever I can, um, place it where it would be, it would absorb those forces in, in the long axis as best as it could. Um, so that's where the benefits truly are of the trilor material. Now, talking about different cases and different abilities of doing so, you know, not every case are meant for a overdenture bar case. There are all, not every case is meant for a hybrid zirconia. So understanding what the differences are is certainly something that is important. Now, if you're getting a case that's an all on X and the patient just doesn't have, you know, the proper lip support, for example, a zirconia case may be challenging and may be difficult because you need a flange whereby to bump out that, that area underneath so that the patient almost gets a immediate Botox, for lack of better terms. But you want to get a fuller looking, um, and you can accomplish that only with a um, overdenture bar, with a with a denture. But if you're doing zirconia, certainly the it's, it's aesthetic. It's uh, a fixed solution. And it, whenever you have a low interdental arch space, um, you can certainly, 12 millimeters or less, you may want to consider doing a overdenture bar. Similarly, if you need to, a flange, as I just mentioned, as well as implant access holes are created aesthetically compromising. You can angulate these where normally, you know, again, you may not be able to do a zirconia because the implant is coming out of the labial or the buccal surface and therefore compromising it aesthetically. With a bar, you can do a lot of those corrections. And certainly with attachments, you can now even create a, the access hole where you want to. It's also a removable and serviceable option. Uh, patients love it, especially those that are coming out of a denture. They love the, the ability of removing it at night because that's what they're accustomed to. Again, we want to provide them with a solution that is comfortable, that is biomechanical, biocompatible, and something that they feel comfortable within their own uh, biological space. So it's really important. And if they're accustomed for the last 10, 20 years to remove it in or in, at night in order to um, cleanse it, then so be it. A removable is, is fine as well as serviceable, that's again for the dentist when they, they have recalls of, you know, depending on the dentist, three, six months to 
sometimes a year recall um, to service it, they're able to remove it very easily, be able to cleanse it, check the implant site area to make sure that that's all healthy and appropriate, and then replace it back after cleaning it. As I said, the, my friends at Alien Milling who did supply this pink, and you can see that the, the bone with the pink is really you know, something that provides for a great benefit. Now, what is better than a bar over denture dental hybrid? And this is, um, you know, pictures that I, I've gotten from my friend Jack Morano in Absolute Dental. So these are some of the, the consequences of inappropriately using titanium, uh, titanium bars. So an overdenture, as you can see. Now, these are purely because of mastication forces, right? So the patient bites down and whether they bite down on something or whether, you know, the, the titanium is not going to give. And in this situation, believe it or not, even though it becomes a troublesome or challenging for the dental laboratories because we're fixing these over and over again, um, but this is a better result than the same forces going down into the implant fixture and the implant platform. Now you can create a bar like this. And as you can see in the, in the, the kind of sequence of the protocol that I've shown you, you can really create quickly and easily um, you know, with some dental IQ of being able to place it right underneath the, the, the denture to really support it really well. And as you all know, I'm sure Jack Morano from Absolute does an incredible job. And here's a finalized solution to the same thing, utilizing Trilor with a, a fixed or hybrid um, uh, overdenture. The aesthetics and the quality is certainly, um, super, you know, um, head and shoulders uh, above anything else. You know, certainly zirconia is gorgeous and, and has its place and it's still the gold standard. But the opportunity of having a lightweight, biocompatible and really aesthetic results are, are here for you. As well, outstanding aesthetic results, you have Lee Culp, who uses this as well, which who, who provided this picture on the left as well as, again, Jack Morano did the same thing and with the individual teeth. Whether it's a thimble type of, Toronto type of style, the same is used for a Trilor. Um, and just the results with the Emacs is absolutely gorgeous of what you can use. And all of these, again, are courtesy of, of Jack Morano from Absolute. The work that they do is absolutely incredible. And certainly, if you're not following them on Facebook, if you're not following them on social media, I, I suggest doing so. But the workflow, there's also an opportunity for those, if they're not in digital technology, Trilor has this, um, something that's called a, um, a Trilor Arch. Now, the case was completed by James Diverge from, um, and what Trilor comes in an analog format, and there's some videos on, on YouTube through Harvest and I believe Zong as well, that allows you to then utilize this type of material if you're not digitally equipped and you know so for those of you that are perhaps are have a conventional and analog uh, laboratory that are, have not engaged in digital doesn't mean you're out of the game you're absolutely within the game you're able to utilize they come in in these type of arch forms that are are three thicknesses 3.5 to 4.5 and i believe 5.5 and you can select the thickness but then you can actually customize the by grinding it with a carbide um, to get the exact dimensions that you want. I've even have dentists that use these for a radiograph, as you can see here, and to check that it's it's everything is sitting properly. At the end of the day, you can accomplish this by manually um, grinding it if that's what you choose, and then processing an overdenture to that. Now, there's tremendous benefit to that. If you recall, as I showed you, the failure of the titanium bridge earlier. Um, the, in the very beginning, I shared the composition of the material of Trilor. The composition of it is 75% glass uh, fibers with 25% with composite. Now, that's important to note because the bondability of the material is incredible. Titanium doesn't bond well to acrylic, whereby uh, this material, polymers to polymers, are like material, are the same material, and therefore bond incredibly well. And that's where the 25% composite matrix that holds the fiber, the fiber, um, the glass fibers, really creates a very strong bond, and you don't have to worry about delaminating um, in these cases. So how do you bond? 
Um, it's a very simple process. You sandblast the trailer using a, um, you know, a disposable aluminum oxide of 50 microns. We all have that in our laboratories, just being able. And what you're doing is you're actually cleaning it and creating a, me a mechanical retention on top of the chemical retention of the two together, the two like materials together. So you want to just uh, sandblast it at, you can use 50, you can even use up to 110 microns, depending on what you have in your laboratory. I personally use the 50 microns at two bars. And then I go ahead and I clean it with air. You have to make sure that your air is truly clean and is oil free and water free. Um, any oil is going to affect your bonding to the material because it's an intermediary um, uh, material that would be in between the two and it's actually hydrophobic it actually pushes it away rather than bonding it so just make sure that your your compressors are truly they use a dryer they have a dryer and that they are oil free and water free so after you sandblast you can go ahead and you can just um you know air clean it and then treat it with a little bit of silane if needed to be, and then apply, apply the acrylic resin or the composite, whichever one you use, right onto the material. It bonds incredibly well, and in fact, sometimes we've, um, when we were testing the material, we needed to remove, or we, we actually tried like flaking it, and it wouldn't come off. It was absolutely amazing that the, you know, acrylic is so uh, brittle in its nature sometimes, um, that, you know, just flaking it off or just kind of picking it off, it comes apart. But when, once it's bonded to the trilor, it doesn't do that because the two like materials become one and it truly behaves in a very strong way, lending itself to a permanent implant um, supported solution. So something that's really something to, to notice and, and engage in. So again, what are the benefits for the patients, which are first and foremost, are the importance of it, is the metal-free biocompatible implant solution. You know, biocompatibility is something that I believe in very strongly, and it's something that isn't, unfortunately, discussed very often, but it's something that is very, very important. And certainly the, the COI Center um, and other centers, educational centers, uh, speak to that a lot, because it's, at the end of the day, it's what is going to sustain and be viable in the mouth um, that is important, right? We want to make sure that the material sciences are correct and 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 there therefore provide solutions that are going to be the best functional and then ultimately the aesthetic. This is the approach and the mindset that you know when approaching a trial or when I, you know first was working with it, I looked at and it made sense, you know, where other materials did not. It's it's it, they were a solution. And not knocking them, there were a solution for sure, but it just didn't make sense biocompatibility to me. And I was always hesitant and not very confident doing those type of cases. But now my, it just makes logical sense to me, knowing the material science, knowing how they work, knowing how it bonds, that I'm a lot more confident and therefore I refer and, and advise a lot of my clinical uh, clients um, to utilize this and they absolutely love it because it's a lightweight biocompatible it protects their implant protects the patient's investment while making sure that they're comfortable while having as I shared with you talking to patients where whereby they, they say that they feel like it's their own teeth uh, some have even reported that it eliminates headaches where they've had uh, other solutions uh, very heavy solutions that they felt it was it provided it, it made them have a headache they were feeling like they were carrying something that was foreign and something that was too heavy not to mention also oftentimes they they were very conscious about it so they were always thinking about their smile they were always thinking about their teeth their their tongues uh, constantly felt like it was a foreign object in their mouth and having this type of implant solution which is what's so exciting eliminates that you know they actually come back especially those patients that have had other solutions or other restorative solutions once they're converted to a trial or biocompatible solution they actually report back saying that they they they're forgetting or forgot what it's like to not have their own teeth which is a huge compliment for um the the product and the solution for sure but a finished trilor arch weighs approximately 21 grams compared to a zirconia which is close to three times uh, its weight. So you can imagine if you were to put something in your mouth, you know, three times the, the, the heaviness of it is, is significant. 
and I mentioned to you also, and we're coming towards the end, where the opportunities to use Trilor are plentiful. So whether you're doing, and there's, um, you know, I do, I hold classes also for the implant bar kind of thimbles, uh, which are, again, Trilor material. They're also called a Toronto bar. So these are two different types of bars. Uh, this one is if you were, and it's very popular in Europe, where you, you create a, a substructure and then build uh, out of composite the teeth to it. So almost look at it as a force infused to metal with ceramic overlay, but instead we're using uh, trilor material, which is incredibly lightweight. It's strong, but yet adding composite to it um, overlay. Uh, certainly, a Toronto bar is one of my is one of my favorite solutions as well, if not the overdenture. Because what you can do is you can create a bar similar to this with individual preparations that then accept designed everything is designed through digital obviously you can do split files you can do there's a library that's available for uh 28 preparations um and once you in, and it's in three shape and but once you design it you create the arch form and it literally positions perfectly divergent um uh, preparations and with the perfect angulation with the perfect one and a half millimeter margins chamfer margins that you can do either Emacs or you can do zirconia, whichever way you want. Now that provides a great benefit for the dentist also, because even if let's just say something like this, not only is it lightweight and certainly biocompatible, because the same the same functionality as I shared with you about the overdenture follows with the Toronto bar. But now you have individual restorations. And that's something that's very powerful. And, and what dentists like, and it's a little bit of a, a, a different kind of solution, but it's still available through the a workflow and a process and a material science of Trilor. But the laboratory can fabricate individual restorations for that bar. Now, let's just say Mrs. Jones goes to Jamaica and happens to chip a distal of number eight, for argument's sake. Um, you know, if it was a zirconia case, what would happen? We would probably have to start from scratch. But with something like this, it's it's fixable or repairable, I should say, chair side. So Mrs. Jones, hopefully she came back from Jamaica. She calls Dr. Smith and Dr. Smith says, yes, come into my office, be here and whatever, be here tomorrow, be here tonight. Then the next phone call would be to, to the dental laboratory. Now the dental laboratory has that file of, uh, of the tooth right there and then they can produce it if it's an emacs they can produce it in 20 minutes and then crystallize it if it's zirconia it may take a little bit longer up to three hours two hours whatever have you to center it but the point is that now it, the, the case doesn't have to go back and forth from the clinical office to the laboratory the the patient doesn't have to be without their teeth while something is repaired we can send a a um, the restoration that chipped or, or broke to the the clinical office, the dentist can remove that just like they would with natural teeth and then place it back with the new crown. The beautiful thing to it, even if as he's removing it or her, or the dentist is removing it, if they, they happen to damage the trilor, it's okay because their resin cement, as long as they don't obliterate the preparation completely, which hopefully is not the case, but even if around the margins, the resin cement that they will subsequently be cementing it back on the, on the Toronto bar will fill any of that composite area that perhaps is missing. So that's also a huge benefit to what I hear from my, my dentist clients is that they're able to repair a chair side. They're able to simply and easily repair that. Another scenario with this type of um, solution is that if the gum recedes for any reason, if the gum recedes, again, with flowable light cure composite, the dentist can, can uh, correct that in, in chair, uh, in the chair, rather than having to remove the prosthetic, having Mrs. Jones without her prosthetic, sending it to the laboratory, waiting the one or two or three days, whichever have you, with wherever you are, and then coming back. So it's two appointments where the dentist can now fix it within the same appointment, 10 minutes, and off the, out the door, the patient goes happy. So it provides so many benefits beyond just the biocompatible, which is huge, um, and biomechanical, but it provides benefits to the patient for its lightweight, but and provides a significant benefit for its repairability and um, retrievability uh, for the dentist. 
So as far as I'm concerned, it's a great, great um, solution, implant supported solution that really has the whole gamut of win-win for everybody, from the patient, who is first and foremost, our dentist clients and the laboratory. There's a tremendous profitability, uh, as well as control and time of what your expertise are and what you can portray to your uh, your dentist clients. Again, just want to emphasize whether it's digital or through the arch. Uh, unfortunately, with the arch, you can't do the Toronto style because it's just not thick enough, but you can absolutely do an overdenture, um, similar to here, uh, where you process the denture to it. You can even tap into these with attachments if you wanted to. There are some, you know, that do telescopic copings with great success, as well as for some of those problematic paranormal functions that, that Bruxa that just tears through their night guards. I've even done trilore type of uh, night guards with great success. They're un it's they're unable to go through it because of the the glass fibers, but yet it's a it absorbs the the forces and therefore they feel better in the in the morning and they don't feel those muscles really really grabbing on the way they do with mouth guards i know some patients that have gone through their mouth guards in in this little as three weeks four weeks where this had lasted significantly longer and they're they're very happy and in fact every time it comes for you know an annual recall where they they, they the dentist offers them a new one Oftentimes they're like, no, no, I want to keep the one. I'm comfortable with the one, and 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 so they go. Um, also, RPDs can be accomplished with this uh, through digital means. So the opportunity is really, it's more of a material science. The benefits of it is tremendous, and what you can do with it, as well as you know, for uh, you know, anything long-term provisionals. If there is a uh, immediate load or anything like that, that you know, for for any kind of implant work. Um, and I know that the patient is going to be, um, you know, not recalled for a long period of time. I would rather do a, a trilor um, uh, temporary, and I know that, that that will last for a very long time. You know, there's even a business model that I've spoken to a laboratory that, that helps or, or has uh, provide service to dentists that are socioeconomically disadvantaged, their patients that is. And what they offer is something like this, where it could be um, in phases. So they offer a, um, you know, a Toronto style bar where they, they will wear that and then they can flip them or rather the overdenture bar and then they can flip them into a Toronto bar once they have more money. So the opportunity for long term and permanent is really truly there to fit into your business and your business model and into your laboratory because you're providing benefits to the to the patient first and foremost in biocompatibility and biomechanically, but you're also providing tremendous benefits to your clients in, in saving of time and not and being able to repair and retrieve and not have to have another appointed appointment in order to uh, reestablish. And ultimately, as I shared with you for the laboratory, it is affordable, meaning the puck you can accomplish a lot more. And you can see here I have a, um, a bar, a, a temporary, I think it's a, a seven unit temporary and an RPD and a single crown in a single puck. So you can, you can absolutely nest very easily three, very easily perhaps four, depending on the dimension and even five bars at a fraction of the price of whatever you're outsourcing it to. And ultimately you, ca you recapture your time at the laboratory, which is also time equals money. So it's something that really I, I feel strongly about, and this material is very versatile and offers a lot of different solutions for different things in different ways. So although this webinar was focused on overdenture, there are other applications, uh, but the overdenture is something that if you're right now outsourcing your, your titanium bars and accomplishing this, this, this becomes a conversation piece and you'll see it's an, a quick and easy convert for your dentist clients because they will logically understand the material science, the biomechanics of it and the biocompatibility and the lightweight. They will offer it to their patients because they too will feel strongly that this is a good solution and a better solution for their patients. So with that, I know we're running out of time, so I just wanted to thank everybody uh, for, for joining us. Hopefully you found great value. And uh, if there are any questions, I know Fran's gonna come on in a little bit and um, hopefully there's some questions. Yes, at this time, we're gonna open up to questions and I do have a couple, Daniel. So the first is, why choose Trilor over Pectin? 
This attendee worked with Digital Dental in Scottsdale and had some issues with failure on nano hybrids constructed of similar products. Right, so the um, Digital Dental does use Trilor as their substructure. Um, the failures, I'm not sure, understand, you know, I would have to see kind of what happened. It's very easy to understand. I mean, I happen to like Crystal Ultra a lot. It is a very aesthetic restoration. What the failure was, I would have to see the actual case. As far as the pecton and different than the Trilor is purely the, the fiberglass, uh, the glass fibers. Um, you know, pecton is a high performance polymer, but it doesn't have the reinforcement of the glass fibers. And I think that's where, um, you know, you see the, the difference. And as I showed you from that chart earlier, with the, the absorption of forces and the strength, which are, and I forget, it's either double or triple of what pecton may have. And that's purely attributed to the glass fibers, the multi-directional glass fibers. So they're going in 360 degrees. Uh, degrees all around in multi-direction, really holding on with it in a 25% matrix of a composite. Um, so it's it's within the same class of of uh, polymers. However, the fact that it's reinforced with glass fibers, I think, is is head and shoulders above the rest that are are, are not. And Trilor is the only one that that has the glass fibers uh, reinforced in a high performance polymer. Okay, Daniel, and one of our other attendees would like to know if you can just touch on bonding again. Of course, of course. So the, the bonding, it's its a very simple process. You know, cleanliness is the most important for any kind of bonding in the mouth, uh, you know, when we're bonding titanium or anything like that. But uh, bonding the trilor to an overdenture, you know, it's a little different. I can certainly, um, um, than a Toronto, for example, but it's its very simple. You, you would sandblast the entire surface of the trilord material. Um, and again, that's more for cleaning it, removing any kind of oils, removing as you're working with it and any kind of debris. So you want to sandblast it so you have a very, uh, you know, you remove that very thin layer of the top so you have a clean and pure version of it for whatever it's gone through. Um, then you sign, you you air clean it just to remove any of if there were any debris from the sandblasting, and then you can silanate it. And then actually, believe it or not, if you're utilizing composite or acrylic, you can just process it or or uh, build it right on top of the trilor. Again, the bonding really comes from the like materials. Like materials like like materials, right? So if it's the same material, they bond really well even as taking a step back with poison fused to metal, we always had to do a wash bake in order to do a, a very thin layer so that the subsequent bakes after that, the subsequent layers now are adhering to the opaque rather than the metal because that's how you accomplish a stronger bond, right? So if it's a light material, like and like, they bond really well to one another and they become one. So once you, whether you're layering composite or whichever way you're doing, or you're processing acrylic to it, it, it's polymers are plastics and acrylics are fall into the plastic category and they bond really well to each other. The key is though, making sure that it is clean, oil-free, debris-free, and anything that may affect that bonding. Once you sandblast it, you clean that surface, you air, you air, Kind of blow it off to make sure no debris on it you can go ahead and, and then uh, process either the acrylic or build up the composite right on top of trial and the bonding is incredible 